Hi there. Come on in. I'm Fred Trost, and like you, I've been sweating the summer heat, especially when it comes to fishing. But you know there is a way to beat it? Night fishing. Mark Martin, Captain Mark Ooh. Martin of Muskegon, there. fishes all night in Muskegon Lake, and besides staying cool, he catches big walleye. That's when they feed. We're going to feed, too, on an award-winning recipe for cream cheese fish rolls. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Major funding for this program is provided by Stro. By sharing the responsibility to preserve our natural treasures, together we ensure our right to enjoy them. Stro, partners in preserving America's outdoor heritage. Michigan Outdoors is funded in part by the Valley Chevrolet Leaders, offering values as big as all outdoors on Chevy cars, trucks, vans, and 4x4s. The heartbeat of America, your Valley Chevrolet leaders. This is the one that goes on the wall? Yep. This is a good one. Oh, look at that. Look at it. Okay, I'll tell you when to net him. When you, when you see his head, when I get him laying on his side. Okay, put it underneath him. Get him, over, get him in, get him in. The net might, there we go, that's a nice one. Nice one. Okay. Mark Martin grew up on Muskegon Lake. His dad taught him the shorelines and points, also the bottom structure and the migration routes of walleye. Mark learned that during the day you can catch walleye all right, but rarely the big ones. At night, he rarely catches the small ones. Oh, geez, oh, Pete. That's a nice walleye, Mark. What yeah, do you think? That's, I'd say until I get them out of the net here. Five pounds? <laughs> oh, easy five pounder. Easy five pounder. Mark has also developed the touch for catching big walleye. Just wait, just do it like you did before. Okay. This, this is a monster. This is, oh, this is, oh, this is a nice one here. Look at them, look at them out there. Look at them, look at that. That's, I'll, I'll, you better put that one on your wall, Bob. Ooh, look. I'll get him tired here. Oh, oh, oh my gosh, she's got to go eight pounds. Okay, slide it, okay. Then put him right in, yeah. Oh. We've learned a lot watching Mark catch walleye. It's tougher than it looks. Those big fish are surprisingly <laughs> gentle when they strike. We haven't, we haven't been on an hour. Uh-uh, not even an hour. It's usually like this, too. When Mark says it's usually like this, he's talking about the nights when the weather is stable. This night, it was perfect. And Mark went on to take his limit. Big walleye are more comfortable moving into shallower water to feed at night, staying in deeper water during the day. They move along structure when they migrate to feed, and Mark finds that structure with his graph. Some of it can be real tricky to fish. Just a uh, high structure right in here that comes off the bottom during the lumber days. Uh, they piled up their um, slab wood. They just dumped it off here and it just formed different peaks here and there out in the deep, deep water. So we're looking at wood right there that yeah. silted it over and... Yeah, that silted it over, yeah. And uh, you can... And I don't see any wood sticking up, but uh, a lot of times in some places where I fish, you'll see wood sticking up off the bottom here and there. But uh, right here, this is mainly where it's slabs laying down. Those peaks are about uh, f uh, 14 feet from the surface? Yeah, 14, 15 feet from the surface. And then down here, you're getting into 30 feet of water and uh, 20. Uh, most of it's 15 right across here, though. And there's a few suspended fish, like right there and right there. And this is just interference from the top of the water. A little, because it's kind of warm up towards the top, you get a lot of different readings out of that. Interpreting these readings is what helped makes Mark Martin successful. He does this all at night by flashlight. And as you might guess, he snags his share of expensive lures on the bottom. Hit the lure when it goes down. Well, either either from. that or hook right onto the lure. Mark is using a lure retriever on a string. Few tackle shops sell them. You have to buy yeah. these mail order. Just about, I maybe. There, I got it. Yeah, there, I got it. You got it? Yeah. You can just let it down there, and it'll slide down, and then it'll get hooked onto the hooks. You can reel it right up by them. 
This lure retriever is called a hound dog, and for Mark, it's well worth the price. That's right uh, for what, almost six bucks right there, saved about a four dollar and some cent lure. You do that a couple times a night. So you save yourself uh, 12 bucks a night, maybe? At least, At sometimes, least? sometimes more <laughs> like 50. <laughs> well, we'll just leave the old hound dog sitting out here. Yeah, it's quite the... Might need him again. Yeah, especially when you're fishing around all these slabs and everything. It really uh, makes a difference. Now let's go see if we can get one of these uh, nice uh, walleyes to hold on to it here. Bob Garner took a little while to learn the touch on walleye, and he lost a few. He's oh, oh. They won't let, give you a break, will they, oh. Bob? It oh. could have been. <laughs> that was a nice one, too, oh. wasn't it? Oh. Was that a nice that one? That is a story of my Muskegon Lake fishing luck. <laughs> That's the story of my walleye luck right there. <laughs> oh, poor Bob Garner. It was frustrating to watch Mark hook and battle fish after fish and not be able to bring one all the way to the boat. But that's fishing. Every species is different, and each method is different. Big walleye shake their heads, and they throw a lot of hooks. There, wasn't they? Boy, I thought I had him racked. <laughs> what, did you feel him, too? Yeah. There are a number of things that Mark Martin does to increase his success, but one of them is to sharpen hooks. He sharpens them throughout the night, and it gives him an edge. No. Oh. Razor sharp, aren't they? Yep. See, I'm kind of setting the hook every time. It's a halfway decent one. Now watch the way Mark battles a fish. Keeps constant pressure, arms extended, cushioning the yanks of the fish. Ooh, yeah, this is a oh. fighter. Nice fish. Yeah, this is a nice one here, too. I love when they come up. This, this one's a fighter. This one might not. There are the extended arms, constant pressure, there. but Oof. not horsing there. the walleye either. That's a nice fish there, too. Holy cow. <laughs> I don't know of any guide who has a record like Mark's. Each season, his customers land yeah. about 75 walleye that qualify for Master Angler or Stroh's Fishing Awards, all of them at night, all of them on body baits trolled about 15 feet down a long structure. And during hunting season, his success, it increases. There he is. <laughs> Another Muskegon Lake walleye. <laughs> That's right, another one for the frying pan that many anglers would put on the wall. Night fishing. That's not easy, but the action can be hot. Just an idea you might want to try in Michigan outdoors. Our guides have varying reports of walleye around the state. Uh, the best catches, Saginaw Bay, up to 10 pounds. Easy limits, according to Gail Bador. At Houghton Lake, uh, Manuskong Bay, over at Lake Gogibic, they're getting a few. Bayshore Resort says they're catching some limit catches in uh, Bay Danak. And up in the UP, the Keweenaw, they're getting them up to 10 pounds, according to Dick Blau up there in 15 to 18 feet of water. Perch, we have some water problems due to the wind. They're getting some jumbos in Lake Gogibic. Throughout the north, it's pretty slim around the Great Lakes, even in the south. Captain Nichols off South Haven says the cold water has dwindled their catches. It was 1,000 per trip. I'm sure that that will be bouncing back. If we look at bass and bluegill, we have some good catches reported. East Bay of Houghton Lake. It's not the West Bay because I fished there last weekend and we didn't get any limits, but bluegill, 8 to 10 inches. Smallmouth bass off the pier at Charlevoix, off the drop-offs in Bay to Knock. Uh, getting limit catches in Manuskong Bay, a smallmouth, but in the Keweenaw area, they've had so much rain blowing in, unpredictable weather. Of course, that's the case on salmon. Up there, they have had in the Keweenaw, though, some two to five pound limit catches of lake trout, 60 to 100 feet of water, but we need cool water. Throughout the rest of the state, bad weather, lots of fishing, few fish, not catching many, except limit catches off Rogers City. They have just started in the river, the salmon, but they're still only catching two to three over at Oscoda. And stream trout, well, I'd say there's some good opportunities there. Rusty Gates says the cooler weather is great. The flying ants are out. The water is coming up in much of the north, and we do have limit catches in the western end of the upper peninsula. 11-inch brookies, 7 to 10-inch rainbows and brown in the, in the Keweenaw. So there is some good fishing and a good chance to get in the trophy book. <laughs> ¶¶
Here's a fish that's well named, a moon eye in a trophy at 15 ounces caught by Francis Sidorchuk from Berkeley, took it in Lake St. Clair on a night crawler. Whoa, is that a nice Saginaw River walleye? Jigging through the ice with a Rapala, Joe Dembski from Montrose caught this 30-incher, weighed nearly 10 and a half pounds. 11-year-old Stephen Kirkula from Nagani cast a red and white daredevil in the Michigami Reservoir in Iron County, hooked and landed this 21-inch, 5.5-pound smallmouth bass. <laughs> a hot day, obviously. And here's an end-of-August brook trout from a stream in Marquette County, 2 pounds, 2 ounces. Howard Trado from Troy caught it on a rooster tail spinner. Les Canets from Ida joined the ranks of successful turkey hunters with this 20-pound gobbler. It had a 10-inch beard and was taken in Montmorency County. Looking ahead towards the morning of November 15th, some of us will be as lucky as Ron Arthur from Langsburg who bagged this buck near home. It's an 8-point, but the spread of 21 and 5 8 inches gave it a score of more than 28, a Stroh's Award winner, and for Ron, the title is our Michigan Outdoors Big Buck Hunter of the Week. Well, there's a good dog day's activity in the month of August. Get out on a pontoon boat with a bunch of people and have a good time on the water. A lot of people do that, and they hang up their fishing poles, but not everybody. There's fish to be caught in these lakes. We're here on a 68-acre, small mid-Michigan lake. You can see the building developments around it. It's a private lake, a lake that has bluegill, pike. What else? Bass. Bass. We have some kids here who have caught a monstrous fish in the dog days, the first weekend in August, right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> now, you, look, at, look at this fish. This is not what you call a typical small lake fish, is it? Not really, not by this lake standards, I guess. Yeah, you know what it is, don't you? Big fish in anybody's book. When Abby was there, his 14-year-old buddy Hal Leppola were the accomplices. 15-year-old Ron Egress was the lucky angler who figured out the strategy to entice this big boy to take the bait. But exactly what is it? Well, it's not a northern pike, which was planted in this lake. Northerns have dark bodies with white spots. This has a light body with dark spots, and the spots are in somewhat of a striped pattern. The consensus is that it's a tiger muskie, a cross between a northern pike and a muskie. A look at those choppers shows us that it's an eating machine, one that somebody must have slipped into this lake when it was small. But now it's large, with teeth as big as a dog's, but much sharper. Muskies have been known to eat all kinds of fish, birds, and animals in the water, which is why you need heavy tackle. Now, the rod and the reel don't have to be all that large, but for live bait, a treble hook is in order, and when you're going for a trophy-sized fish like this, a wire leader can protect your line. You were ready for him. Okay, how big of a minnow was it? Uh, about four inch chum. And you threw it out where? We, we uh, about 20 yards from shore. Yeah, about 20 yards or so. Same time of evening that you about saw it the same night time, before? Yes. How long did it take before there was some action? Well, not too long. Cast out. Two minutes. Two minutes. I started. Two minutes. I started. I started walking back for my other rod so I could like cast for repellas and uh, with the repella for other fish and or bass or something while I was waiting for something to hit this. Came back and something was well. Wind told me something was happening, so I came back, checked it out, and set I, the hook. Yeah. And then what happened? <laughs> I don't know. I it's like well, I tried to reel in, kept on moving out. Every time we got it close to shore. It, Took a run back in the lake. Did it ever break the surface of the water? A little bit, just like the back. It didn't really jump up or anything. It just stayed quite low. And every time we came in with nuts or anything, it ran out again. So there they were. Wynn and Hal were scrambling on shore. Ron had been battling for 15 minutes, and that 22-pound muskie was tiring. This is the net usually used for a fish in this lake? Yeah, if, if you need one at all. Well, th th that isn't going to work. <laughs> you must have known that wasn't going to work on this fish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what'd you do? We got this net. <laughs> oh, we got another net. We got a smelt net. So you got on the on this end with the smelt net, huh, Hal? Yeah. And you were on the front end? Yeah. And Wynn was on the back end? Yeah. And how did you do it? I want to see how you <laughs> how you netted it. <laughs> you got that end and that got that end and lifted them up one. out of the water? Yeah. What a story. They soon had a crowd gathered. They put the monster in a wheelbarrow and showed the trophy off to the neighbors who were obviously amazed that a big muskie like this had been living in their neighborhood lake. 
But it's even more amazing that Ron Egris caught it so easily. But that's what happens when a plan comes together. Ron sized up the situation. He figured the big muskie would prefer minnows to a lure. He got the right-sized minnow, fished at the same time in the evening in the same place he saw that muskie earlier, and it worked. Now, fish are creatures of habit, but there are a few basic principles to follow, which Ron Egris from DeWitt followed to catch his trophy. Number one, live bait is a winning method because it's a natural food, but the fish have to see it. Now, never let it lay on the bottom because a minnow like that will always try to hide. Keep a minnow suspended where it can wiggle and attract hungry fish. The smaller the hook, the lighter the line, the better because the fish can't feel it as much when they pick up the bait. Now, with worms, Hook them only once through the collar on that light-colored band. You want the worm to wiggle, to be seen, and a feeding fish will slurp the whole thing, even a whole night crawler. With lures, same principles apply. They should wiggle, but not move too fast. A crankbait like this with a big lip that makes it dive deep when you retrieve it will cause it to get down where the fish are. Okay. You don't want a fast-moving bait in the heat of the summer. Another way to beat the heat of the summer, fish when the fish are not hiding from the heat, try night fishing. That's when Mark Martin catches all of his big walleye. He says that's when they move into the shallows to chase the minnows. If you don't mind staying up, you can find some good midsummer action after midnight. Oh, oh, oh my gosh, she's got to go eight pounds. Okay, okay. <laughs> There's a national organization that's going on the offensive to protect our hunting rights. It's called the Wildlife Legislative Fund of America, and it can use some help. Now, they've designed a program called Protect What's Right that educates non-hunters about wildlife and hunting. Survey after survey shows that when Americans know the facts about what hunters do to propagate wildlife in its habitat, they in turn support hunting to the tune of 80%. In Maine, Oregon, Ohio, and South Dakota, an organized Protect What's Right effort saw anti-hunting and trapping proposals just crushed at the ballot box. The organizers are having difficulty contacting sportsmen's clubs in Michigan and could use some help. You could help by sending us the current names and addresses of outdoor clubs you think would be interested in learning about the Protect What's Right program. The Wildlife Legislative Fund will send them information along with an invitation to a meeting in Lansing on September 17th. This effort could be extremely important to the future of hunting in Michigan, at least among hunters who want to protect what's right. Rod Kisrow from Newberry wrote me to ask, how does the DNR calculate the winter severity index to determine how well the deer are doing during the winter? One tool they use is a chelometer, which is a pressure cooker. It has a heater in it, and they measure the amount of electricity it takes to keep the water at a constant temperature. It simulates how much energy deer need to keep warm. They also measure the snow depth and how difficult the snow is for a deer to walk through. They use a weighted pipe to check penetration of deer's hooves in the snow. Now, they give numerical values to these measurements, and when the total reaches 100, they know a number of deer will have reached the starvation level. I'll report the Deer Severity Index each week beginning in December. Boaters use something that resembles a kite and works in a similar way in the water. What is it? A sea anchor is a cone-shaped canvas device that works like a kite in the water and is used to keep a boat's bow heading into the wind as it drifts. It's a safety tool in rough seas and an aid to anglers who drift fish on windy days. Nancy Krakowicz from Free Soil sent this recipe for cream cheese fish rolls to us. It took the number one spot in our wild game and fish cooking contest last March. And it's just a top drawer fish recipe. Oh, that... stuffed or not, you have to try this. You have to have a taste of it. It's like an appetizer, really. It is. And, and it and is. Tighter turkey and ham. Well, would be great. It's called cream cheese fish rolls. And the fish you could use, there's some walleye yep. in the background, some catfish right there. Okay, you really can't tell the difference once they're cooked either. They you can't, and that's good taste. white fish. Oh, great fillets. Yeah, cream cheese, and we use the softened kind. Breadcrumbs and egg, onions and mushrooms, and you're kind of, just going to kind of fry those, just saute them. 
and butter. And she says to use real butter. And she sounds like she knows what she's talking about. This is typical of the recipes that win in our contest and the ones that the judges like because it's simple. Yeah, that's right. But it's elegant, yep. tastes great. Looks good. Looks like you've cooked all day long and something like this. Going to mix up your cream cheese and then put the onions and mushrooms and butter. I want the butter to go in here, too, instead of trying to drain it off. Oh, you don't want to miss a bit of richness. <laughs> <laughs> you sure don't. Watch that Oh, in. I know. Okay, going to add two tablespoons of the breadcrumbs right to the mix here. Well, at least two so, tablespoons. Yeah, well, maybe a little bit more. It's going to kind of go a little bit there. And this mixes up fairly easy. And you're just going to pound these. And that's a good dip, so, by the way. You could you yeah. could serve that as a dip. Yeah, just like that. If for some reason the pounding process got a little out of hand now, <laughs> you used for the first time you tried this with a regular meat pounder. Yep. It and, worked good to me. Oh, I thought, it did. <laughs> it did. You pounded that little the, fillet was just flattening out like it was supposed to. Yeah, pounded the daylights but right out so of the... so was the wax paper. <laughs> wax paper and the fish. Yep. And it, I had picked the little pieces out. So we you want to use again. the flat side, definitely. Found out that this works... Just as good. Yep, flattened out just like it's supposed to. Okay, and then you can, once they're flattened out without the wax paper, you're going to put the cream mixture on these. I think that flattening it, it would sort of tenderize it a little bit. Oh, yeah, it does. And it would flatten it out. Well, and make they're it, even then. You sure. Know, you don't have thick and then thin. Wrap them up. Yep, dip them in egg. You want to roll them pretty good in egg because you want the breadcrumbs to stick. And go roll them in breadcrumbs. So this has breadcrumbs in it yep. and on the outside. Well, the breadcrumbs inside just kind of holds it together. And there they are. Bob Garner is already done with his first one, and I suppose you want us to remove this large one, Freddie, Bob? under penalty of death. <laughs> you better give me that. <laughs> okay. There it is. This, this, Safer for all of us. You, you've heard about the greatest fish stories, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the greatest fish recipe ever told on camera. This well, is phenomenal. This is how it was ranked by our judges as being tops. The best. And yeah, let's take a look here. I'll use, I'll use mine to cut it in half and you can see the fish is rolled around the outside with those mushrooms and the onions and the cream cheese in the middle. It makes a very light, oh, it does. tasty. And like I say, when you're tired of turkey and ham, it's different. This would be a great recipe for a New Year's Day. Oh, it would. You know, we'll get some letters from people say you threw a lot of junk on the fish and the, the fish won't taste through. It does taste through. Oh, yeah. This is the greatest fish recipe. Would you like a copy of each of the award-winning recipes we feature during July and August? Well, they're in the Outdoor Digest magazine along with the mailbag and quiz questions and answers. Find out about the Outdoors Club events we have coming up, what's new at the museum, how to qualify for a Stroh's Award so you can appear in the trophy book, and articles such as this in Fisherman Jim on how to catch walleyes with spinners. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again. And all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we'll try to chase down those elusive salmon that have been so difficult to locate because of the winds on the Great Lakes. We'll talk to charter captains at various ports and get a forecast for the next few weeks. The Great Salmon Hunt next week right here on Michigan Outdoors. Sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan <laughs>